Welcome to part seven. We only have one planet to play with. There's only one planet Earth that has nurtured the evolution of our species and the infinitely complex web of life of which we are a part. By destabilizing the Earth's climate system, we're causing that web to fragment. If we intend for life on Earth to continue, we are leaving to our children and to future generations the impossible task of repairing the damage that we are causing while living in an increasingly harsh and hostile climate. Even if all the nations that signed the 2015 Paris Agreement lived up to their emissions reduction pledges, we would be living with over three degrees centigrade, 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit temperature rise by the end of the century. A plus three degree world is unlivable. Even worse, business as usual puts us on a path toward plus four degrees centigrade, 7.2 degrees Fahrenheit, or more by 2100. Plus four degrees centigrade is beyond unlivable. Even the goal of 1.5 degrees centigrade set in the Paris Climate Accord is incompatible with life as it has evolved on planet Earth over the last several million years. We need to achieve climate stability by 2100 below 1.0 degrees centigrade, 1.8 Fahrenheit, above pre-industrial averages. In terms of level of accumulated emissions of CO2, we need to stabilize by 2100 at or below 350 parts per million. So how do we get there? The first rule of holes says, when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Our first job is to stop making the problem worse. We do that by reducing our current emissions as quickly as possible by focusing on high potency, short-lived climate forcers with large radiative forcing impacts. Methane and black carbon are two such high potency, short-lived climate forcers with large radiative forcing impacts that trap more heat than CO2 in the near term. We've mentioned them both already. In this graph, we compare methane, CH4, a relatively short-term forcer in yellow, with CO2, the long-term forcer in red. In 2017, global emissions of CO2 were about 36 gigatons. Methane emissions were much lower at about 0.36 gigatons. But remember that methane is about 150 times more potent than CO2 in its first year. So when we multiply the amount of methane emissions by 150, its first year of global warming potential, we see that methane's impact was equivalent to about 54 gigatons of CO2, its CO2 little e for that first year. And that small quantity of methane, about 1% by weight of CO2 emissions for that year, will remain more potent than CO2 for about 10 years. Black carbon, the F gases, and other high potency, short-lived climate forcers are similar to methane. Their greatest climate impact occurs shortly after they are released. Reducing emissions of these climate forcers can immediately help reduce the radiative forcing that is heating our planet. Part one of the solution is to stop digging. Part two, is to start filling in the hole that we've been digging. Filling in the hole refers to removing from the atmosphere a significant amount of the 2,200 gigatons of atmospheric CO2 that have accumulated over the course of 250 years of emissions. Collectively, these strategies are usually referred to as negative emissions or removal of atmospheric CO2. I think of them as cleaning up our mess. Within this realm, there are two approaches. First, 
There are the nature-based processes for removing CO2 from the air, usually referred to as sequestration. And second, there are the technology-based processes, usually referred to as carbon dioxide removal, or CDR. But be aware that these terms are not tightly defined and are often used interchangeably. Recall that our target for achieving stability included reducing accumulated emissions to less than 350 parts per million by 2100. Without removal of atmospheric CO2, we can't get to 350 parts per million. We will focus on carbon removal strategies for the remainder of this video. But let's remember, it's not an either or. Net zero as soon as possible and removal of atmospheric CO2 are both compulsory. They are complementary and compulsory. We must do both. Reduce current emissions to net zero and do CO2 removal on a massive scale. If either part is not addressed, we risk losing civilization as we know it. I know that civilized society hasn't been on its best behavior lately, but I think we deserve a shot at redemption. And remember, the faster we reduce current emissions, the less reliant we are on removal of atmospheric CO2 or negative emissions. The IPCC's 2018 special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade said, quote, all pathways that limit global warming to 1.5 with limited or no overshoot project the use of carbon dioxide removal on the order of 100 to 1,000 gigatons CO2 over the 21st century, end quote. To stabilize global temperatures at less than one degree centigrade above pre-industrial levels, the estimated amounts to be removed are substantially larger. The top bar is that range of values of CDR needed to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. To put those numbers in context, total accumulated CO2 emissions are around 2,200 gigatons, and all current human-caused emissions are just over 50 gigatons per year. Estimates of the amount of negative emissions needed are approximate and depend on the rate of ongoing emissions, concentration of accumulated atmospheric CO2, and unknown climate feedbacks and tipping points, some of which are already being activated. And lest our excitement get the better of us, the special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade notes that, quote, CDR deployment of several hundreds of gigatons CO2 is subject to multiple feasibility and sustainability constraints, end quote. Nature-based carbon dioxide removal, sequestration methods, are our best near-term option. Nature has been reliably cycling carbon since long before the arrival of our species. Healthy forests, grasslands, wetlands, and oceans are critically important parts of any climate solution. And nature-based sequestration provides a long list of co-benefits, creation of habitat, increased biodiversity, increased agricultural productivity, increased soil water retention, increased air quality, and more. As I go through these negative emissions options, I'm going to include some ballpark estimates of the number of gigatons of CO2 which could be removed for each. These are estimates which will undoubtedly be refined as scientific understanding grows. Agricultural land use over the past 12,000 years has released an estimated 488 gigatons CO2 into the atmosphere. Yet rebuilding and retaining soil carbon may well be one of the most impactful actions we can take to reduce atmospheric CO2. We can act on two fronts, restoring abandoned agricultural lands through restoration of native ecosystems or planting 
non-agricultural vegetation and implementing regenerative agriculture practices. Regenerative agriculture or carbon farming practices include no-till or low-till farming, reducing or eliminating nitrogen fertilizers, adding compost, cover cropping, hedgerows, riparian buffers, managed grazing, and many others. Depending on the amount of suitable land on which regenerative agriculture techniques are applied, it's estimated that between 14 and 22 gigatons CO2 could be removed in the period 2020 to 2050, or 0.5 to 0.73 gigatons per year. This includes both sequestration and reductions in emissions caused by agriculture. Primary forest loss worldwide in the 30 years since 1990 amounts to almost 200 million acres. Forests act as huge repositories of carbon. When forests are clear-cut and degraded, this carbon is released, contributing to the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere. And it's not just the trees themselves, it includes the understory vegetation, surface litter, and soil. We can protect forests by keeping trees intact so they continue growing and absorbing CO2, proforestation, replacing trees in a forest which have been damaged or destroyed, reforestation, and growing new forests where none existed before, afforestation. All of these approaches, of course, have numerous co-benefits. The potential for global CDR through forestry practices is estimated to be around 2.5 to 4.0 gigatons per year. Wetlands are areas that are neither dry land nor open water, either permanently or intermittently. An estimated 87% of wetlands have been destroyed since 1700. Wetlands can either be a source or a sink for atmospheric carbon. Some wetlands can be as efficient as a tropical rainforest in restoring CO2. When wetlands are damaged or destroyed, they become carbon emitters. By protecting wetlands from conversion to agriculture or other types of development and protecting them from contaminated runoff, we can maintain their function as carbon sinks. Wetlands protection and enhancement has the potential to remove an additional 0.13 gigatons per year. Oceans play a major role in moderating the heating of our planet. It's estimated that a quarter of the CO2 and 90% of the excess heat resulting from our climate pollution has been absorbed by the world's oceans. But oceans have suffered as they have served as a buffer to global warming, resulting in both increased acidification and rising temperatures which degrade and destroy entire ecosystems. These ecosystems must be protected, restored, and expanded. Kelp forests and seaweed beds sequester significant amounts of CO2. Plants not consumed decay on the ocean floor and become part of the sediment for millions of years, serving as another means of sequestration. Hard-shelled creatures, notably phytoplankton, settle on the ocean floor when they die, taking their carbon with them. Mother Nature is our best guide and our best ally. But because we have gone so far astray, nature-based solutions alone won't get us back to 350 parts per million. We have to employ technology-based carbon dioxide removal solutions and they all have shortcomings. In the realm of technology-based CDR, there are four main options. Bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BECS, biochar, direct air capture and carbon sequestration, and enhanced mineralization. Let's have a look at each one. Bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BECS, 
is the process of burning biomass or biofuels to produce electricity and capturing and storing the CO2 emissions in a form that keeps it out of the atmosphere for at least 100 years. Logging and mill residues, agricultural residues, and municipal waste are the most common feedstocks. VEX can be damaging depending on the origin of the feedstocks. Feedstocks that are dependent on logging can lead to the degradation of forests and intact ecosystems. Feedstocks which depend on crops grown specifically for energy can displace food crops, increasing food insecurity, and compete for water and other limited resources. Reliance on BECs can also delay the transition away from fossil fuels. The potential for global CDR through BECs is estimated to be between 3.5 and 5.2 gigatons per year. Biochar is a charcoal-like material produced by heating biomass in conditions of low oxygen concentration, or pyrolysis. Gases are released as a valuable byproduct, and the remaining charred organic residue is biochar. When used as a soil amendment, it can contribute to long-term carbon storage and increase soil fertility. The longevity of biochar stored in soils is dependent on the type of biomass used, the pyrolysis temperature and duration, soil conditions, and climate. Biochar production is relatively low-tech and inexpensive, but limiting considerations include the energy cost of the materials, the cost of transport, and the possible competition with agricultural lands for non-food biomass production. The potential for global CDR through the use of biochar is estimated to be from 0.5 to 6.6 gigatons per year. Direct Air Capture and Carbon Sequestration, or DAX, is a process of capturing CO2 directly from the air and injecting it into permanent underground storage or converting it into materials used in manufacturing, industrial processes, or permanent storage above ground. DAX can capture CO2 in a wide range of locations from a range of sources, including from transportation, industry, generation of electricity, etc. The process facilities don't require large amounts of land or water and generate little waste, though they do require large amounts of energy. The high cost of DAX has impeded its deployment, but the use of cheaper renewable energy and the advantages of scale are increasing its viability. On the downside, in addition to the large energy demand to run each site, capturing CO2 from the air in significant quantities would require massive global deployment of industrial scale facilities. Also, if a direct air capture facility is not located above a geological formation suitable for long-term storage of CO2, extensive pipeline infrastructure might be needed. Enhanced mineralization or enhanced weatherization involves speeding up the natural processes by which various minerals absorb atmospheric CO2. In the oceans, crushed alkaline rocks such as limestone could be spread on the surface to absorb CO2, potentially counteracting the acidification that results from the absorption of atmospheric CO2. On the downside, the process could alter biochemical cycles and release toxic minerals. Enhanced mineralization on land involves soil amendment with crushed silicate rock, which absorbs CO2, promotes soil fertility and productivity, and helps neutralize acidic soils. If two-thirds of global croplands were amended with basalt dust, up to 10 gigatons CO2 per year might be extracted. But such an effort would require mining, crushing, 
and shipping an amount of rock that's about twice the 2019 global output of the coal industry. Truly daunting. We are now living with climate conditions that the Earth has not experienced for over three million years. Given the reality of the climate crisis and given the many delays involved, we must be willing to face the challenge of restoring a stable climate by implementing both near-term and long-term solutions. By focusing on the leading indicator, radiative forcing, as well as the lagging indicator, temperature, our solutions can be far more effective. In the whole analogy, we first reduce the rate at which we're digging by tackling our current emissions, and second, we begin filling in the hole that we have already dug by tackling our accumulated emissions. We slow down the digging by targeting the short-lived climate forcers that have an outsized radiative forcing effect, methane, black carbon, and others. And we start filling in the hole by addressing our accumulated or legacy emissions, for this is what the climate system responds to. We begin by wisely and aggressively removing atmospheric carbon dioxide, assisting Mother Nature with the strategies that have worked for billions of years. Forests, soils, wetlands, and other nature-based solutions. And we simultaneously get to work on the technology-based solutions, especially those that have potential but are not yet proven at a global scale. In the words of New Yorker writer Elizabeth Colbert, technology-based carbon removal, quote, has become vital without necessarily being viable. It may be impossible to manage and may also be impossible to manage without. End quote. As a species, we are incredibly clever. Given the popular and political will, we have the ability to solve mighty challenges. The climate challenge is a mighty challenge. We were born for this challenge. In the words of Sir David Attenborough, what happens next is up to every one of us.